Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live extreme weather briefing with a marginal risk for severe weather to discuss tomorrow across eastern Texas, and that includes portions of the DFW Metroplex. But this is definitely a low end severe weather event. Uh, in fact, the Storm Prediction Center, uh, even Broyles, uh, has a below 2% uh, tornado risk here. Very low uh, end in terms of straight line winds uh, and uh, that hail threat. But nevertheless, there is a marginal risk across East Texas, and it does appear that we are in a very active pattern right now across the southern U.S. with quite a few waves that are forecast to come across uh, at least three over the next few weeks. And I do think that one of these is probably going to be a big severe weather event uh, before about the 20th of December. It's possible that none of them will be, and they could just become prolific nor'easters in the northeastern U.S., uh, but I do think there's got to be some severe weather uh, with these systems, even though these are just a little bit uh, moisture starved, probably because of the Gulf of Mexico being so cleared out uh, during hurricane season may have something to do with it. But there is that risk, the Storm Prediction Center risk that includes the DFW Metroplex. Um, I did get a wisdom tooth out yesterday, so I do have a bit of a crater in the upper mouth that I don't want to blow my clot across the room. Uh, but definitely can easily do these lives. I would otherwise have probably chased in East Texas tomorrow. But I'm definitely watching the next few systems, uh, including that nor'easter now uh, that is being forecast to hammer portions of the, the northeast. But uh, even though the models are in striking agreement uh, for that system, we'll break everything down here, including the event uh, tomorrow. And uh, also break down the very active long-range pattern. I also want to share with you. Uh, some additional results uh, from the rocket paper, uh, all of which is made possible by uh, the Facebook supporter group uh, making our team dominator field research happen. That includes the rocket launch from 2019. I'm almost done with that paper, finally, uh, that journal article. Uh, if I have a least favorite subject, it's probably technical writing. Uh, but I just got to grind through it here. And almost there, got about 25 pages written. And I uh, just need to do the conclusions in that. But I wanted to share uh, a couple of those results uh, with you guys today. But that research wouldn't be possible if it weren't for the Facebook supporter community. Uh, so please come check us out uh, if you want to be a part of this groundbreaking science. And uh, the next step is to bring Dominator 3 down from Canada and then launch a barrage of rockets into the tornado. We're going to have a big directional launcher that has row after row of rockets. And the game plan is to shoot a barrage of rockets into the tornado. Mark says that with our current system with one antenna and one receiver, we can track up to nine tornado probes inside the tornado at the same time and still stream uh, that live data. And uh, we could probably even go upward uh, from there. But here is the system in the GFS. That's going to be the issue tomorrow. Uh, notice how these are diving just a little bit uh, further south uh, now with time as well. This is just one model, just the GFS model here. And uh, this is the evening forecast. This is the Pivotal Weather website too, which is an incredible website uh, here for model visual visualization. But here you can see this big flow diving south across the western U.S. So initially when this system is ejecting from northern Mexico, and it did bring quite a bit of rain last night across southern Arizona. I heard from my good friend David Rankin down there out of Tucson, the flash flood chasing guru. Uh, he's actually tracking asteroids that uh, could be uh, potentially heading toward Earth. So he works in an observatory on a mountaintop there in Tucson, just outside of Tucson. And uh, he's the reason, uh, he's, he uh, guided me to intercept those debris flows and flash floods uh, across the Arizona, uh, Utah border up there near Big Water. That Johnson Canyon flood was all David Rankin. He knows those uh, canyons, those flash flood setups, like the back of his palm. And he actually has flash flood models that are based on hourly rainfall data superimposed on topographic maps. And he can, he can actually predict the arrival of those debris flows, set up shop, and try to intercept them with drones and whatnot. Uh, but w monsoon season has been relatively inactive the last couple summers uh, since that one three years ago. Uh, but there was some much-needed rainfall there across southern Arizona with this weird kind of El Nino-like pattern that we've been in despite the maturing La Nina in the tropical Pacific. And a lot of that is because of the warm water uh, from the extra tropical branch of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, of the PDO Horseshoe. And I'll show you uh, some sea surface temperature maps as well and discuss some of the ramifications for our climate. But this is the open wave here ejecting tomorrow across Texas. Some vorticity advection here across eastern Texas. Anytime you have an open wave in the middle and upper portions of the troposphere, downstream of that, that's where you get the positive vorticity advection surface pressure falls, the development of those surface lows, 
Also, the development of a low-level jet about a kilometer above the ground, those southerly winds. And uh, this is at 18Z Friday, which is a minimum uh, for the low-level jet. That's because you get peak mixing in the middle to early portion of the afternoon. But still, you got a decent low-level jet there in East Texas, uh, in excess of 30 knots, approaching 40 knots already by 18Z, which is noon, uh, Central Standard Time there. DFW Metroplex eastward uh, through the uh, Texarkana region up into the Ozarks. And uh, let's see what the GFS has for moisture. The GFS tends to underdo moisture return uh, for these setups. And even so, the GFS still has 60 plus dew points, right around 60 into the low 60s, notching up into East Texas, up to the Oklahoma border, up to the Red River by 18Z. And then that axis pushes just a bit east uh, by the 0Z time frame. But you got mid 60s dew points there uh, from Southeast Texas, streaming northward toward Texarkana. And uh, that's the GFS, too. So let's take a look at what this NAM model has uh, for moisture across East Texas. And it has even better moisture across the NAM. You can see some near 70 dew points there right along the Texas coast uh, to the southwest of Houston. And that axis is pumping northward there. Uh, so as expected, the uh, GFS is underdoing the moisture return just a bit out there. Let's see what the 0 to 3 kilometer EHI is, a composite index, to really kind of show roughly where that surface base instability is co-located with the low-level wind shear. And you can see a decent slug there across eastern Texas showing that instability axis right there into the mountains of southeastern Texas. Looking at the 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicities, those are a little bit better uh, beneath that core of the low-level jet. A little east of that instability axis, though, as is often the case, but there's going to be some overlap down there. You can see this main instability axis is just a little bit west of the core of that low-level jet. But usually on the eastern fringe of that cape axis is where you can get uh, the most favorable soundings for tornadoes. And uh, you can see that this sounding here right in that eastern gradient of that uh, low-level jet is just a, or just a little bit west of the core of that low level jet and you can see that the maximum one to two kilometer winds it really doesn't get above 30 knots and it is quite veered to the west of that decent instability though decent lapse rates to this elevated mixed layer uh, some veered low level winds as is often the case but then to the east of that you start to ramp up that low level shear a little bit then you can start to get those soundings a little bit more favorable for tornadoes less thermodynamically favorable a bit of some skinny cape so one thing that this is suggesting is uh, certainly a weakness with this setup and that shows that the strongest low level shear is not quite co-located uh, with the strongest instability uh, in fact there's a, a hardly uh, any uh, surface space instability beneath the core uh, of that low level jet still though i expect a line of thunderstorms to develop within this instability axis you've got cape in excess of a thousand there some straight line hodographs though in the core of that instability axis uh, that's to the west of that instability axis and these straight line hotographs like this, uh, that, that instead of that big curved hotograph that you'll see with those big tornado setups, the straight line hotograph like this uh, equally favors the left and right splitting supercells. So this favors quickly splitting supercells. You don't have a dominant right mover with these straight line hotographs. Uh, really a, a weakness in terms of storm relative shear uh, with the left mover and the right mover split down the middle by a straight line hotograph. You do have decent bulk shear though uh, which usually determines the development of supercell storms and those rotating updrafts. Uh, the rocket paper has shown uh, that the mid and upper level uh, mesocyclone is more of a tilted dynamic updraft with more larger scale uh, rotation. And then you get a transition zone and then a more vertically oriented tornado vortex below that. Uh, the Linwood tornado showed that vertical tornado vortex below uh, about 8,000 feet. And uh, below that, you had a vertically oriented vortex and then this tilted vacuum cleaner that went up with height. And uh, really, anything below the boundary of that tilted uh, vacuum cleaner, the lower bound uh, of that uh, vacuum cleaner hose there that is the mesocyclone, any eddy beneath that is a candidate at getting stretched and coupled with that mesocyclone and becoming a uh, supercell tornado. In this case, though, you definitely have a decent instability axis. If I was based out of Norman, of course, I would be chasing this this system there you can see the weakness of the cape according to the gfs i usually use the gfs model for the long range and for breaking down uh, the general view of the upper level pattern and then i use the models like the nam 
the uh, wrap model and the H triple R to really drill down a little bit and see where the best overlap is uh, between instability and wind shear. So this is by Friday evening. That trough is ejecting there. You can see across Texas uh, flattening out a bit. Uh, so this trough reaches its peak just as it's entering the southern plains. Here you can see the next storm system diving southeast. You have that big ridge over the northeastern Pacific with those warm sea surface temperatures underneath it. That's the extra tropical branch of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation that I'm telling you about. And we knew that we'd have these uh, systems diving down to the Pacific Northwest, amplifying over the Rockies, peaking over the Southern Plains, and then flattening out just a bit as they move across the Southeast. But we have had an erosion of that subtropical ridge that dominated the Southeast throughout hurricane season. So now these things are digging much further south and even becoming candidates at developing into coastal storms, even nor'easters. Here you can see the next one down the pipe. So this is what I mean when I'm talking about a pretty active pattern in the long range here. Uh, and the European and the GFS are in quite good agreement here. So I do think that one of these storm systems is likely to uh, produce severe weather across the southern U.S. Here's the next one uh, coming in for the 15th, 16th here. That'll be early to middle portion of next week. This one uh, does not appear to be favorably shaped to really pump that moisture northward with it. Uh, so I think this is also going to be a marginal severe weather event. You can see kind of a weak low-level jet there uh, because of the shape of this system. Really favors the dominance of the northerly flow kind of on the back side of this system. This one could be some kind of a uh, winter storm producer. But really the shape of this system, the timing of its intensification, a lot of this weird flow located on the back side tells me that this one is not going to be the one that's going to make big severe weather in Dixie. But I do think that this next system could be the one. That's going to be around December 19th. That's the one that we're definitely going to keep an eye on. And any of these systems are a candidate to develop into a nor'easter, especially this one right here as you go into the 17th, 18th. Look at that big, deep trough there over the northeastern U.S. There's going to be a blocking high that's going to set up over Greenland. But this system right here is what I'm watching for a potential Dixie Alley event. And this will be toward uh, the end of December. Look at this one ejecting like a bowling ball, much stronger than the one that's moving across the southern U.S. and northern Mexico. That's going to bring severe weather maybe to eastern Texas tomorrow. But this one on the 19th, I'm definitely watching very closely. Could be a severe weather event across Dixie. Uh, this uh, is a, a, a gains more of a neutral to negative tilt across the ejection from the southern plains, which I do think is going to lead to a more robust low-level jet here. This is a kilometer above the ground along the Mississippi River Valley. And this is likely to pump more moisture northward uh, than these next systems, including the marginal risk uh, on the one tomorrow. Uh, this one is definitely one to keep an eye on across Dixie Alley. And this would be about the 19th. So this would be next weekend, probably like a Saturday, Sunday uh, type of a system. Look at that. And that low-level jet maintains its intensity across Dixie Alley overnight on the 19th. And uh, you don't want to break down the specifics this far in advance. Uh, this is almost this is about 8, 9, 10 days out. And uh, the GFS has been showing a Dixie Alley severe weather event on the tail end of this uh, the 7 to 10 day period for a while. Uh, but it seems like as you get closer to these events, they just don't quite pull that deeper moisture northward through the uh, warm sector. A lot of times they're shaped a little bit weird too. But this one looks to be a little different. I think that there's going to be a kicker before Christmas that comes out. And it's going to be a more favorable shape to the trough ejection. There you can still see these meager dew points in the warm sector, but realizing that it is uh, the GFS and the long range, and as we get closer to this event, if it does maintain that type of a shape, I'm confident that the short range models are going to launch big time dew points northward with this system. There you can see that surface low located over the Ohio River Valley. Likely to have some severe weather down this with a Pacific front surging on its southern side. Probably a warm front lifting northward also. There's that surface low. Probably going to have a nice stripe of snow too on its north side. And then you get the transfer of energy out there. Potential nor'easter that could happen there as well. Any of these systems are capable of becoming nor'easters when you get these systems coming in in the southern stream. But you really need that blocking high in Greenland uh, because then you get more of a buckled upper level pattern. 
you get the positive feedbacks that happen. This is a 12Z GFS, takes that system out to sea. You really need that blocking high to force these systems to churn up the coast because then you get more of a buckled upper level pattern. You get more cold air that dives south out of Canada uh, with the surface reflection of that high. So this is a system that could be interesting as well for the Northeast. Uh, the GFS and the European were in rough agreement with a big stripe of snowfall right along the coastline. Everybody posting those snow maps. This one could be a decent nor'easter 16th into the 17th, and this could hit the I-95 corridor as well. Uh, the timing is perfect. Look at that low start to bomb out to 991 millibars there just offshore. Big stripe of snow uh, there through New York City as well. Look at that. But you never want to get even uh, at 160 hours out. Uh, with these nor'easters, even just 12 hours out, 6 to 12 hours out, they can take a little wobble. There can be a little bit of a different shape between the coupled jet structure, uh, a little bit of a timing of the phasing of northern and upper level, uh, uh, northern and southern stream systems. Definitely can uh, wobble that heaviest snow axis just a little bit away from your homes or a little bit closer to the coast. The last nor'easter certainly underperformed right along the coast, at least compared to some of those uh, latest model forecasts that were coming in. It wobbled a little bit closer to the coastline. The warm nose hugging the coastline there kept those snowfall totals down a little bit, whereas just inland and in the mountainous terrain, they certainly got hammered. And just like we're watching each of these systems in the southern stream for Dixie Alley severe weather, we're watching for the shape of the system to be appropriate to have a strong low-level jet. We think that tomorrow's system is not going to be an outbreak. It's going to be more of a marginal low-end severe weather. But it looks like that system around the 19th or 20th could be a big severe weather event. You're also watching to see how these southern stream or these systems that are diving way into the southern U.S. behave when they encounter the temperature gradient on the western side of the Gulf Stream. Which ones of these will turn into nor'easters? Which ones will have a system diving in from the northern branch to couple? And I believe that's why these nor'easters often happen during El Nino events or El Nino-like patterns because you have kind of a phasing of systems within the northern and southern branch. You get that blocking high over Greenland and all hell breaks loose. But I am by no means a synoptics expert. Of course, took all the classes. I try to keep up on all the latest meteorological trends. I do consider myself more of a severe weather expert, though, and uh, I feel like I'm a little bit better versed to watch these systems for severe weather. But I can also talk about the meteorology with nor'easters and synoptics and derive all the mathematical equations and whatnot. But really my passion is more for severe weather and uh, tornadoes. So let's take a deep, deeper dive with the uh, NAM model and then we'll take a look at the uh, HRRR here across the Southern Plains for tomorrow. Surface low is a little bit too far north uh, for this event. Uh, the NAM is hinting at quite a bit of cloud cover associated with that moisture return, especially on the east side of that instability axis. Quite a bit of moisture here surging off to the north. There you can see these warmer temperatures on the west side. This signifies the instability axis. Cooler temperatures, though, and a stout low-level jet uh, where that low-level jet is located. And uh, usually when you get kind of a decoupled lower atmosphere where you get the decreased surface temperatures, that's when you get a bigger one kilometer wind or a stronger low level jet. Less mixing is happening, whereas out to the west of that low level jet axis, that's where you get uh, a greater mixing. The sun comes out, uh, causes uh, that strong low level jet to average out between a kilometer above the ground and the surface. And then you get a weakening of the, the wind a kilometer or two above the ground. You get a strengthening of the surface wind and a reduction of that low-level shear. But where you can maintain those cooler surface temps and, and temps and cloud cover, that's called a decoupled atmosphere when the surface temperature is a little bit cooler out there. And uh, that, that causes an increase in the low-level wind shear. But you can see that the thermodynamics just aren't quite there. Not a lot of surface base instability, despite a, despite a more favorable uh, hodograph shape uh, that you can see there uh, with that low-level jet in excess of 40 knots at a one kilometer range 
you get though, a lot of mid and upper level flow strong enough in a bulk sense between the surface wind and a loft plenty of wind shear to get supercell storms but the thermodynamics just aren't there in the core of that low level jet so that's a weakness of this setup at least according to the nam model is that that instability axis is west of the greater wind shear so here's that instability axis case generally less than a thousand the instability axis does does push push east and actually enhance just a little bit but so does the low level jet pushes off to the east as well so that's why there's not a lot in terms of the energy helicity index which is a composite index uh, based on surface based cape and in this case the zero to one kilometer storm relative shear that's because there's not a lot of overlap between the stronger low level shear to the east and the surface based instability that's moving in from the west you never want to get too bogged down with these composite indices i can tell you that but some decent wind shear decent directional shear even here between the surface and a loft but then look at that veered low level jet so you get a big time reduction of the low level shear there within that instability axis whereas here a little bit greater wind shear you can see that the surface winds are more out of south southeast direction the low level jet 40 knots out of the south southwest uh, roughly unidirectional compared to the 500 millibar flow but in this case the 850 flow is even more veered than that upper level flow surface based sin see a reduction of the sin or the convective inhibition here by zero z across east texas so That's where the uh, severe weather may indeed happen. But you can really see how that instability axis, this is a zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity, which is max basically along the uh, Louisiana, Texas border through the Arkitex and the Southwestern Arkansas. Whereas the majority of the instability is just to the west of that Western gradient of the zero to one kilometer storm relative shear. And that's at 36 hours out. This is a NAM model. Let's take a look at the HRRR here. And similarly, uh, the HRRR, the new and improved HRRR that goes out like 48 hours now, you can see this low level shear as well to the east. And this is the area here to the east of this front that has instability, but you can see a dramatic reduction in the low level shear behind where you have, uh, behind, like basically from this line east. You have a lack of surface based instability, but an increase in the low level jet, an increase in that zero to one kilometer uh, shear. And then to the west of that low level jet axis, you have abundant surface based uh, instability, but a reduction in that low level shear. And here's the low level jet. And you can see that, the, not surprisingly, the low level jet axis is focused uh, where that maximum in the zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity is located. And then you get a veering or more westerly low level winds here where you get more mixing where you're mixing down the westerly component air from a kilometer or two above the uh, surface down to the surface stronger surface winds more westerly component out here and so in that area where you do have surface based instability and this is at zero z you get a lot of mixing too so here's the three kilometer cape and uh, you can see that just east of this cape axis that's where the strongest instability is found or the strongest low level shear is found strongest instability is basically bleeding into the uh surging into the uh, texas piney woods here but it's well behind the wind shear so you just kind of have this blob of instability sitting here we can look at a sounding here where the peak instability is located and look at that straight line hodograph surface wind southwesterly one kilometer wind southwesterly two three kilometer wind they're all the same direction and a straight line hodograph like this, even though you have big shear in a bulk sense between the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere and the surface, that gives you supercell storms. This hodograph favors equally the left split and the right moving supercell. So you just get splitting supercells all over the place. You don't really get a dominance of the right mover, which you really need to produce tornadoes effectively. Could get some non supercell tornadoes out here. But one thing you do have is an abundance of low level cape but even there even with the you know in that low level cape axis you can see how the low level winds veer quite a bit in the uh, bottom portions of the sounding you still get a little bit of a capping inversion there as we're getting about 6 p.m central standard time 
uh, it's December 10th uh, it's December 11th tomorrow so just that time of year where peak heating happens a little bit earlier here's the instability axis at 21z uh, centered over the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex bulk shear though in the lowest kilometer is east of that so look at the bulk shear in the heart of that instability axis. It's only about 10 to 15 knots in the lowest kilometer. Generally speaking, that's not enough uh, to get a robust tornado threat. This would be further east from the Arklatex and across east Texas, but you just don't have that surface-based instability out there. Bet this is probably going to be more of a late show as well. So this is a develop starting to be the development of those surface-based storms. The Gainesville area by about 21Z about 3 p.m. local time you get the development of a broken line of marginally severe storms maybe some supercell structures then you get another development here of storms along the eastern side of that instability axis right on the western gradient of that low level jet where there's just no surface based instability to the east of this thing there is a chance of an isolated tornado or two uh, on the western edge of this where these can squeeze out some surface based instability there but they definitely are star for surface base instability, even though they've got an abundance of low-level shear. This line back here moving through southeastern Oklahoma to far north Texas by 23Z, which is about 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. This, these could be some hail producers. These are probably going to be the severe storms. Maybe an isolated tornado. You never know. Uh, that's one thing I've learned from storm chasing is even when the atmosphere is telling you there's not going to be tornadoes, sometimes they just happen. And then you can figure out later why a tornado happened there. But this is definitely going to be a, a broken line there of beautiful storms, maybe some transient supercell structures in the beautiful mountains there of southeastern Oklahoma to northeastern Texas. Definitely probably a bit of an arc uh, of storms there, but marginal low-level shear, straight-line hodographs, splitting supercells within this line. But definitely with rotating updrafts, cold air aloft this time of year, could certainly get some marginally severe hail within this line and by 1z it really starts to die out and then we kind of get a transfer down here in uh, northwestern Louisiana into far eastern Texas and down there you get some surface based instability that's starting to co-locate with the low level jet a bit there you can see it down here in the Texas Piney Woods so I would say that the best chance of a tornado is down here Tyler Lufkin south of there Natchitoches down into west central Louisiana eventually into Alexandria overnight I do think that there's a chance at 7, 8, 9 p.m. for that surface base instability to finally meet up with uh, the southwestern edge of that low-level shear. This is the storm relative velocity. So there you can see the southwestern edge of that substantial 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative velocity. And then you've got the instability axis coming in here from the southwest. And really where those merge this evening after sunset, I could definitely see a couple of tornado warnings happening down there. Here's a 0 to 3 kilometer cape starting to nose in to that eastern Texas area. So really the northeastern edge of this instability axis there, eventually shifting into west central Louisiana. I could see there being a tornado down in that area. That's a pretty good cape. You can see how you've got a more favorable hodograph. you still got... Uh, some residual wind shear in here some non-zero storm relative wind shear for the right mover less of a straight line hodograph you do have this negative contribution to the helicity between about one and four kilometers and a positive contribution between three four five and six kilometers but these supercells are more determined by a bulk sense between the mid and upper level wind shear and the surface and then tornadoes though are more of a storm relative shear within these individual layers but you could definitely not ignore the contribution of negative wind shear there between that that layer between about one and four kilometers and still not a ton of directional shear even there on the south side but quite a bit of speed shear south southwest wind at the surface at 10 knots increasing to about 30 35 40 knots just above the ground but definitely a slightly more favorable photograph this mode up here is dying out by 1z by 7 8 p.m you're just going to have weakening storms moving into a weak ass environment for severe weather there after dark then we go to 2z and notice how the instability axis is not marching off to the east it stays put and uh, the low level jet begins to march to the east and veer definitely in east texas 
So there's a possibly a narrow window between about 6 and 8 p.m. 8 and 9 p.m. down here in the East Texas Piney Woods toward Alexandria. There could be a tornado, maybe an arc of marginally severe low top supercells southeastern uh, Oklahoma and to just northeast of the Dallas area that should push off to the east. Overall, though, I would call this kind of a, a waste of a system in terms of severe weather. Look at the dew points out here. Really dry in Dixie Alley, even with this system. And that's because the system weakens after it ejects from the southern plains. Instead of getting a big high amplitude system that can tap into some of these bigger dew points in the western Gulf of Mexico. But look at the northern Gulf of Mexico. It's really cleared out out there in terms of dew points. So different than many of the El Nino winters that we've seen. You just got a lot of dryness here in the central Gulf of Mexico. And I think that's going to prevent severe weather from happening with these systems. You can see though some moisture holding out here over the western Gulf of Mexico. Probably some warmer sea surface temperatures out there, less tainted. But yeah, you got dew points in the 50s over the northern Gulf of Mexico there. It's winter. That's about what happens. Yeah, just look at this Gulf of Mexico. Just is getting ravaged. Two points in the 40s there. So that's probably going to prevent that system in the 19th from happening as well. You can see it as it ejects. That low-level jet starts to pull some big dew points up here in the western Gulf of Mexico. That system first comes out. But look at it. Just really dry air mass, dry cold air mass across the north central Gulf. That tells me it's probably going to be pretty inactive in Dixie Alley all the way through. Just some modified dew points lifting off to the northeast for that 19th and 20th system. It is winter, that's for sure. We're probably going to have to go, get till spring 2021 until we see a big time chaseable system. So we got a marginal severe weather event across eastern Texas. Probably going to be east of the DFW Metroplex. I'm really not concerned about this event in DFW for a significant severe weather event. In fact, I think most of those storms are going to be east of DFW. Maybe an arc of low top supercells happening across southeastern Oklahoma into uh, northeastern Texas. It kind of peters out as we go through the day. So I can see a couple severe storms kind of developing like this marginally severe that line will push off to the east and then die as it closes in on the architex this will develop by about 4 to 5 p.m and then die out by 7 p.m once it gets close to the architex then i expect uh storms to develop around the same time 3 4 p.m here on the eastern edge of the instability axis and the western gradient of that low level jet but because the instability axis doesn't eject east across that those storms are also going to die out and really be starved for low level instability despite increases in low level shear and then i think between about 6 and 9 p.m it's possible there could be a bit more overlap temporarily between the surface base instability nosing up from the southwest into the texas hill country maybe into western west central louisiana but you really lose that surface base instability that instability doesn't march off to the east but there is a narrow window for some marginally severe storms, maybe an isolated tornado threat down there as well in the east central Texas Piney Woods into uh, west central Louisiana. And as I mentioned, I wanted to discuss a little bit of our rocket paper. Before I do that, I want to show you this figure that we had going. One of the figures in uh, the early part of the results section. And this is the 10 hertz GPS data projected over the damage path done by the National Weather Service out of Topeka. There you can see that EF4 damage uh, that happened over the Linwood area right as we had uh, peak height of the parachute probe flying up at the top of the triple pause up there at about 29,000 feet. We recorded some gravity wave action up there. But shortly after launch, we did two revolutions around the tornado with more of a vertical axis down there below about 8,000 feet. And then there's a transition zone between the vertical axis of the tornado and this tilted ascent. Not a lot of rotation, hardly any vorticity in this ascent, but this was uh, the mesocyclone above it. This is why we call this more of a tilted vacuum cleaner uh, right there as well. 
and then it reached the apex and fell down the inset there surrounded by yellow that shows the tornado path reaching a peak of nearly 190 miles an hour there on the east side of that tornado and uh actually that is coincident with ef3 damage uh, here over US, us highway 159 we launched just to the south of lawrence uh kansas into that uh, a tornado and then it was carried around inside the tornado and mesocyclone for 30.2 miles before falling out in Leavenworth, Kansas. And I, I want to show you a quick image here that really shows the different phases of the tornado. Uh, this right here is uh, vertical velocity uh, calculated via pressure. And uh, this you can see is the altitude, the GPS altitude that goes all the way up to about 12,000 meters. Uh, this is the tornado portion of that. And you can see some of these big vertical velocities that would come. You basically have a pop in the vertical, and then when you'd have a drop in these vertical velocities, that's when you'd have basically peak horizontal winds. So on that east side of the tornado, the peak of about 190 miles an hour happened when there was very little vertical motion. And then you'd have kind of alternating vertical motion and horizontal motion all the way up the tornado. And uh, the max vertical velocity approaching 60 meters per second there in the upper portion of the tornado vortex before falling back down into that transition zone. And this is a tilted vacuum cleaner of gradually increasing vertical velocity as the probe was inside that mesocyclone. Basically a tilted vacuum cleaner. You have a lot of suction and below that level, below this, you get a lot of stretching of the vortices and that's what causes the development of the and intensification of the vertically oriented tornado vortex. So looking at this, you can see that there are different phases. This is a launch point down here. This is when we launched. And then this, this section right here is when the probe did two revolutions around the tornado, vertically oriented tornado axis. And then there is this weird transition zone right here where the vertical velocities subsided dramatically and then the probe was picked up by the mesocyclone and then that vertical velocity gradually increased all the way back up to nearly 40 meters a second and this was the mesocyclone basically an area of suction above the storm uh, it's not really a compact tornado vortex uh, high up into the mid levels of the atmosphere it definitely stretches out probably shaped like more of a funnel uh, that you would pour oil into you know it kind of widens out dramatically as you go up but you definitely get a lot of suction, a lot of horizontal and vertical velocities there that I believe that anywhere below this transition zone, if you get an eddy or a dust devil or a gust nato or something that happens to migrate off the rear flank downdraft gust front underneath this area of suction, it can couple with that and then quickly intensify to this compact vortex. And you have a lot higher ambient pressure as well. It's easier to maintain force balance with a, a vertically oriented compact tornado vortex as we understand it. But this transition, the transition zone here between the vertically oriented tornado and the tilted mesocyclone is very interesting. We wanna intercept many more tornadoes and see how this transition zone compares between tornadoes in the high plains or those in Dixie Alley or those in traditional tornado alley. We wanna see how the nature of this mesocyclone and the orientation relative to the shear affects uh, the efficiency at coupling these low level vortices into a, a supercell tornado. And then one of the most interesting things about this paper are these gravity waves up here. And uh, these were about when the, the probe was at the highest point in the troposphere near the very top of that mesocyclone. At this time you had the EF4 damage happening too in Linwood, Kansas, right when the uh, probe was at like 29,000 feet above at the uh, top of the mesocyclone. And so at that same time, big time gravity wave action was being generated at the very top of the mesocyclone. And that got picked up with these vertical velocity jumps. We can calculate the period of these jumps, compare it to the brunt by solid frequency at that level, and uh, make sure that these are gravity waves. We've already done those rough calculations. These are gravity waves at the top of the mesocyclone. And interestingly, uh, not coincidentally, these gravity waves were happening as a violent tornado was interacting with the friction of the earth down in Linwood, causing EF4 damage up there. So it's possible you could have high altitude aircraft up near the very high levels of the mesocyclone sampling these gravity waves and relating that to damage being caused on the ground. It's definitely gonna be a big part of our research coming up here. And then this is as the parachute was falling gently to the ground, landing in the 
front yard, the plush grass of a church in Leavenworth where our friends Matthew Dubois and Jeremy Belk discovered it uh, through our social media posts. So this is one of the more interesting figures I'm going to have in this results section. You can see distinct phases in this tornado. The low levels, you have more vertically oriented tornado vortex. Here you've got more of a tilted mesocyclone effect. And then gravity waves up here at the high levels of the mesocyclone near the triple pause, likely caused by that violent tornado interacting with the friction of the Earth. So that's some pretty exciting developments to share. We're uh, excited to submit this coming up here. Definitely making some progress. Uh, finished chapter two there, working on chapter three. Rearranged it a bit. These are some of the figures here. And these are the low levels of that vertically oriented tornado vortex. You can see these are the different components of the wind, but this is that rotational flow. Then you had this little transition zone after the peak in vertical velocities to 60 meters per second that I just showed you. Then you have this weird transition zone between tornado vortex and tilted mesocyclone. Whereas this is that tilted vacuum cleaner effect of the mesocyclone. And you can even see those gravity waves up here at the top and the GPS velocity and the overall GPS velocity there too. Here you can see the change in heading showing the rotational flow below 8,000 feet. This is the IMU data. Basically the forces that were that the probe was subjected to while getting carried through the tornado and the parent mesocyclone. This is some of that meteorological data here. The temperature decrease and increase. This is the pressure based vertical velocities. So exciting stuff here with this paper that we've got going on. Uh, this is that phase that I showed you was the vertically oriented vortex at the low levels, even though you can't see my mouse. And then you can see the tilted vacuum cleaner effect just near the southwestern corner of my image there. But this is what I've been working on, and I'm also developing the educational material for Facebook supporters. We're going to start doing that one night a week as well. I'm hoping to have that uh, in time for this month. A lot of it depends on how quickly I can get this paper done. This shows our launch into the inflow notch of an HP supercell with a ton of rain here in the RFD gust front. Big time couplet there as well with that tornado being indicated. This is the uh, roof mounted rocket launcher with pan and tilt capability. So that's it for uh, my live briefing today. Um, I'm going to get back to doing these more regular live briefings again now that I got this wisdom tooth out, beginning to settle in. Crazy thing, I haven't really felt any pain, and I'm not taking too much in the really uh, much in the way of a pain reduction except for ibuprofen, and I haven't even needed that today. So hardly any pain with the tooth removal is basically a clean extraction. I didn't have an impacted wisdom tooth, but I'm definitely afraid of the dentist. So that, that's that marginal risk tomorrow. In general, there's a lot of weaknesses with the setup. Still some uh, marginally severe weather possible. A couple different modes there to watch that we discussed. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning into my weather reports. Um, uh, streaming live here from my mom's house, breaking down this severe weather and uh, working on this paper, working on some educational material as well. But thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your Thursday. And I'll be live again tomorrow morning to discuss this marginal severe weather event across East Texas that's going to unfold on Friday afternoon. Never stop chasing. <laughs>